Varmt välkomna till Kulturhuset Stadsteatern, till internationell författarscen. Mitt namn är Ingemar Fast, konstnärlig ledare för litteraturscenen i det stora Alkonsthuset vid Sägelstorg i vår huvudstad Stockholm. Och nu ska ni få möta en kär återvändare till författarscenen, nämligen David Grossman i samtal med Ingrid Elam. Kära publik, the audience, your excellencies, the devoted readers. My name is Ingmar Fast and I'm the artistic director of literary events here at Kulturhuset Stadsteatern. This uh, blossoming building brimful of the arts. And we have all gathered here on this autumn evening in late October. And yesterday... A guest of honor, Mr. David Grossman, received the Birma Literature Prize, an international prize established in 2020 through a donation by Thomas and Katarina Birman. Yes, an applause. And Mr. Grossman, he happens to be the very first, re first recipient of this truly remarkable award for his novel Iti Hachayim Esachek Harbe Was it okay? In English More than I love my life in Swedish Med mig leker livet so and now you listen so exquisitely translated from Hebrew into Swedish by no less than Natalie Lanz and she deserves an applause Listen, I am so happy and grateful that Mr. Grossman, that David, expressed his wish to make the public appearance here at International Writers' Stage. And before, before I ask the dear laureate to enter the stage accompanied by this evening's speaking partner and member of the jury, Ingrid Erlam, please allow me to express the following. Imagine somebody waking me up in the middle of the night and urging me to summarize all these years hosting International Writers' Stage. What would then happen? Well, my mind would race like a rabbit. And a seamlessly endless tapestry of voices, of faces, of words and sentences, of stunning silences and islands of laughter, of reflections and afterthoughts, would completely overwhelm me. But after that, specific writers would take center stage, and among them, this great evening's most cherished guest of honor. He's been with us numerous times, a writer and human being, equipped with that rare quality, stature and compassion and curiosity, and always demonstrating always demonstrating his wish to communicate with you, his readers. And each and every time, after he has disappeared once again down the escalator, you experience and you realize that the almost tangible trace he leaves behind is hope. There is hope. Please allow me to deliver my heartfelt thanks to the Beerman Literature Prize and to Thomas and Katarina Beerman. And that said, I think it's high time for me to say the following. Please welcome from Israel and accompanied by Ingrid, El Ingrid Elam, the indefatigable and the one and only David Grossman. Welcome. Toda, thank you. Shalom, good evening. Good to be here. But you're almost at home here. It must yeah, it be the be, fourth yeah. or fifth yeah. time. On, only if someone can reduce the light, I'm willing to confess everything without any... <laughs> oh, oh, now I see people. But, but they you. always had strong lamps when they <laughs> interrogated. Yeah, but uh, well, now I feel less threatened. Yeah, <laughs> good. Um, well, let's start talking about books and other things. Um, Life Plays With Me is the title in English yeah. uh, of the book for which you were awarded this prize. It sounds so harmless, 
But I found a quotation in the book that is not so harmless. And it's the narrator of the book, who's called Gili, and she's the younger, so to speak. She's the daughter of a daughter. <laughs> she's the grandchild of perhaps the central figure in, in this novel. And she says, within brackets, I have an issue with the sorrow of randomness, but that's for another time. But I think perhaps this is a good time <laughs> <laughs> to talk about the sorrow of randomness, because I think, at least in my reading, it's something that, it's a trail you could follow in your authorship, yeah. in your books. What a question. Uh, so often I meet people that I feel that in their life uh, there is a, a great part of randomness. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, to be very literary, I think of uh, Franz Kafka working in the insurance company in Prague. This is randomness. He shouldn't have been there at all. He should have been sitting at his desk and writing. You feel randomness uh, at uh, a married couple that you, you, you meet, and you feel that even, even if they like each other, they lack something, something that will glue them together mm -hmm. substantially, something that will, th that will be called in Hebrew, raz. Raz is a secret, but it's a deeper than secret. Mm -hmm. Secret is sod. Mm -hmm. Raz is deeper. And I'm always looking, when I see couples, I'm looking to see if there is this raz, this inevitable uh, belonging to each other. Uh, so often we, we see people who live in parallel to the life they should have had. Mm -hmm. And you understand that they have been struck by this uh, rand randomness. Uh, One of my favorite, favorite books of yours, many of your books are my favorites, but <laughs> <thank> To <laughs> the End of the Land, you yes. can really talk about, not a couple, but three people who are together in the beginning of the book, they are young, they are young uh, soldiers, and they end up in hospital because they have a fever, but they play. They play together. They're so yeah. much like, they're like puppies in that situation. And they, uh, the boys ask the, the girl to choose who is going on the next mission. And she does. Yeah. And there you can really feel, without spoiling anything, the sorrow of randomness. Yes, there, the, the sorrow of randomness in uh, To the End of the Land is even fatal and tragic because she chose one of them, but she didn't know what she is choosing. She had to take a note from a hat or something like that. Uh, and one of them will be sent to a vacation at home, which means to meet with her, mm -hmm. and the other will be sent to an outspot uh, on the Suez Canal. It was in 73, a day or two before the war, the, the October war. And her choice changed the, the life of the three of them. Mm. Uh, and so often we make very small steps and suddenly we find ourselves uh, in the, under the shadow of huge fate, fate that will change our life, that will change our worldview, uh, that will throw us into another reality, into another being. Uh, and, you know, writers have this privilege of changing their character's mm -hmm. fate. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there is also a responsibility, because if you have such power, you have to be very responsible. Uh, and you, you can throw people into a new fate, a new destiny, but it cannot be totally coincidence. Mm. Uh, there, there must be some things that would uh, prepare this extreme change in, in their lives. But then, of course, the setting, I mean, the, the country, 
is in itself creates fate, doesn't it? I mean, I don't think uh, the three of them ending up in an hospital in Stockholm uh, making such a uh, choice, (laughs) they wouldn't have had that kind of fate because they live in quite a different society than than your three. Because the situation is so extreme in Israel, such uh, leaps of fate, not faith, but fate, uh, have immediate uh, strong consequences. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, I remember just uh, an example in the time of the suicide bombs in Jerusalem in the 90s, beginning of uh, 2000, the feeling of choosing your fate by going this way or the other way, taking this road or the other road. Uh, I remember, and this is a scene that I put later in the book, that my my two sons, uh, Jonathan and Uri, they studied in downtown Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And when the bombs started, I started to practice with them which road to take. And I said, if you go from this way, it will be faster, but it's more dangerous. Go to, through this, this road. And, and then after I tried very hard to convince them that I have some knowledge about the future, uh, one of them gave me a very funny look and they said, Daddy, you don't know. You don't know. And little did I know. Uh, but it also must have created... I, I actually was in Jerusalem when the first bus bomb. Oh. I was in King David Hotel that morning. Then you heard and I, the I bomb. I heard it. Yes, yeah. yes. And I, I woke up and wondered, what is it? I put on the television and there it was, an hour later. Yeah. yeah. Very, very special feeling. And I, mm-hmm. I was there to, to make some interviews. And, and immediately you start looking, if somebody sits in a car without moving the car around, you wonder. Yeah, and And every every person who approaches you can be your killer. And there is also suddenly, there was an inner need of people to choose places that looked like safe. Mm -hmm. They were not safe. No one could have told us what is safe and what is dangerous. But we needed in this chaos to create some places that will be safe and secured. Mm And what way has this influenced your novels, do you think? Or do you ever think about it in those terms? I think when I wrote it, I formulated, uh, formulated it to myself. Uh, and there is something uh, tricky about, uh, about the answer to your question, not to say about the question, but if if i write something uh, it means that it's not uh, something that happened voluntarily you know i initiated it uh, i i just want to go back two steps back to the first question about the sorrow of randomness i think in order to avoid the sorrow of randomness uh, i tried i i chose a a, a profession that deals only with relevant things. And when you are dealing with relevant things, no matter what you write, what is the story you write, but the materials of the story are relevant, uh, you become addicted to it. I mean, you want your life to be relevant. You don't want to waste your life on coincidences or just uh, random cases. And uh, the relevance became something that I really insist on in in things that that I do. I don't want to waste my time on people who are irrelevant, on uh, all kind of errands that are irrelevant. I really need to be, and and writing gives me that. I want to be in this uh, situation of being with relevant people, Mm and clearing my life from people who are irrelevant, Mm. even though so much of our fate is dictated sometimes by people who are irrelevant for us. You know, we can have a prime minister that is totally in every point of view is or was irrelevant to me and yet he could have dictated my destiny. Mm. Yes. So in real life we go about, we 
we do meaningless things all the time. We get to take a road and then we turn back because it was yeah. the wrong road and so on. But but you can create a universe when yeah. you write, where you. This is what you mean. You yeah. Can, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so it is. So it is. Let's get back to the, <clears throat> the your latest book uh, because that I, I think it's your first book that also plays outside Israel, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. I went. Yeah. I went with the passport for the first time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because usually I feel that the reality I know is the Israeli reality, yeah. and I, I can decode the codes, and I know how long it takes to the light in the traffic light to change. Yes, this uh, this intuitive feeling, and I, I I can decode the the language, and I I hope I can decode the behavior of people. Uh, but this story, uh, life plays with me uh, a lot. That's the name in Hebrew. Uh, it brought me to another reality, to another country, another continent. Did you go there? Yes, of course. I was. Uh, I, I twice went. Perhaps to we should tell the audience that it's Croatia. It's Croatia. It's an island in front of the seashore of uh, Croatia. It's called Goli Otok. Goli Otok means the, the naked uh, island because no vegetation is possible on this island because of the, the harsh climate. Uh, and the, the main character, one of the three main characters in my book, uh, Vera, based on a, character, on a real person called Eva Panic Nahir, she spent almost three years in this uh, naked uh, island because then in the 50s it was a gulag created by... Uh, by Tito, by Marshal Tito, and she was sentenced uh, to be there, to be re-educated. It was a horrible place. It was like, really, like hell. And of course, I wanted to be there. I wanted to just to feel the, the atmosphere there. And believe me, to be there, even today, 50, 60, what, 70 years after, still you feel the, the horror, the horror of, of violence. Mm. It's a museum now, isn't it? Part of it is yeah. a museum, yeah. yes. And part of it is a kind of a amusement park almost for people, yes. And they come and they take pictures there, mm. uh, dressed as uh, the guards there. And uh, it's very strange. Uh, but I was there because I wanted to absorb the, the radiation not only of the past, but the, the violence that prevailed there. And to, f to see how was it possible for, for my uh, main character, my dear friend, uh, Eva Panic Nahir, how was it for her to be there for three years to... First of all, there were months that she had to push a rock against the slope of a hill. 12 hours, 12 hours a day. Can you imagine something like that? And she was such a, a tiny, delicate person. And I asked her, how did you do it, Eva? How did you have the power to... And she said, I told myself a story, she said. I told myself a story that my daughter is very sick and that on the top of the hill there is a pharmacy. And I had to climb to the top of the hill. So it was not difficult for me. I, I pushed the... Uh, the, the rock until the top of the hill there was the pharmacist he gave me the medication and immediately I went down to bring it to my daughter and I thought how a story can create reality mm -hmm. how you convince yourself in something that is beyond your ability and suddenly you are able thanks to the story but this is also one of your big themes what stories can make telling stories to each other mm -hmm. From yes. the very beginning, I think. Yeah, I, I deeply believe in telling stories and in the the art of storytelling. Uh, and and I, I think all of us, we have this uh, tendency to put our life in, in, in a story, in a form mm -hmm. of a story. Mm -hmm. And it's a story usually about, usually about our childhood, about how our parents misunderstood us, our siblings didn't like us, our teachers were cruel to us. Our and, and over the years we learn how to tell this story in a better and better way and we perfect it and we polish it and mm. we crystallize it. 
But maybe we do not notice after a while to what extent these formal stories of us, to what extent they imprison us mm. and they prevent us from growing up and they stick us in a place that we used to be years ago, but maybe now we are not there. Mm. And maybe we do not need this story anymore. Maybe we really have matured from it and it's only imprisoning us and, and, and paralyzing us and victimizing us. And if we just allow ourselves to tell the old story in new words, which is actually what novels do mm -hmm. mostly, maybe we shall be able to see that there is a way out of this trap. Maybe we are not doomed to stay there. Maybe if we look at the same text of our childhood, we might understand that also mama had a mama. Yeah, and also Papa had the right, or the right for psychology, not only us, also our father. And it applies to individuals, but also it applies to countries and to nations. Mm -hmm. Because nations, they need these legislative stories in the beginning of their being. And usually there are stories about how strong they were and how righteous they were and how moral they were and how they won over their ferocious enemies and they, they turn words into statues and into poems of heroism and all that, but they do not necessarily recognize, again, to what extent they became victims of their stories, mm. of their le legislative stories. And maybe it's important to allow, to allow us to look at our beginnings as a nation and to say, no, we are in another place now, we are stronger, we have more room to maneuver. We should not be totally trapped by, the, by this story. We shall also, we are able also to allow the, the story of our enemy, the official story of our enemy to infiltrate into our own story. It will not change our identity. It will not ruin us. It will only make our grasp of reality deeper and more multi-layered and more real. It will not be just the projection of our nightmares, or our wishful thinking. It will be more real. It will be part of reality. Anyhow, the, 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 they talk all the time about how the Israeli and the Palestinian uh, narratives clash in mm -hmm. each other. I hate the word narrative. I, it's, I, I am allergic to this. I think that the narrative is, is a human story that congealed, that has frozen. And I think that what writers do, just to conclude this very long answer to a very short question, <laughs> but you deserve it. I mean, you asked a very substantial question. Uh, what, what we do when we write a novel usually is to take an, a narrative of, it can be a narrative of a couple who mm. misunderstand each other sometimes, or a, a narrative of the grown-ups against the narrative of the child or the children. And it can be the, the Israeli and the Palestinian narratives. And we are melting them. We try to tell them in a new way that will make a kind of a massage. The writer is a massagist, after all. You take a situation and slowly, slowly make it melt and softer and flowing and more flexible. And, and when you succeed in that, when suddenly your characters start really to talk with each other from the innermost place inside them, then, well, then, then you did your job. <laughs> I, I think there's a lot to be said about that when it comes to Israel and Palestine today, the two stories and how are they going to melt. Mm. But let's, I would like to go back to one of your really early novels first, because when you talk about this, I immediately come to think of Momik in, in uh, See and the Love, yeah. Yeah, who, is a, who is a young boy uh, with spectacles and, and, uh, and uh, what do you call those, braces? Yeah. Teeth? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it a self-portrait from when you were a child? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not that far. <laughs> Not a, okay. But anyway, he, uh, he grows up uh, in a family of uh, 
people who escaped from the Holocaust and live in Israel. And he gets a new relative, a grandfather, yeah. who is not his grandfather, already there. The narrative is sort of distorted. And uh, this grandfather, he says things that are totally unintelligible. But yeah. uh, so that's how I read the book. But Momik, he he thinks he always he hear people talk about over there rather than then. Yeah, it's over there, and it's a Nazi beast, and he sees it as a true beast, and then he starts making up stories about this. So it's really a way of trying to tell a story that is not being told by his parents because they can't talk about it. They cannot talk and even if they talked, I'm not sure he was able to understand no. it that a child at the age of eight or nine can understand the atrocities of the of the Shoah and the 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 cruelty that people are able to perform. Uh, and he, yes, he keeps hearing people talk, talking about uh, Sham there. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that uh, there is this interesting difference in the way that Jews are talking about the Shoah and non-Jews. Non-Jews will say what has happened then. Mm -hmm. uh, Jews in every language that I asked them, they spoke about over there. And it's, uh, it's meaningful because if it happened then, it's over. It's done, no more to repeat itself. There means that somewhere in parallel to our reality, it's still bubbling and it's still an option. And my mommy, he keeps hearing the grown-ups in his uh, neighborhood talking about the Nazi beast, as you mentioned. And he, he starts to, to investigate it. He's a very scientific uh, boy. So he thinks of himself and he asks people and nobody wants to tell him what was the Nazi beast. And he thinks it was a kind of a monster or dinosaur that used to rule over the people of over there and to torment them. And he, he keeps asking until he asks uh, Bella, the owner of the grocery store, uh, who was the Nazi beast? And she don't, doesn't want to tell him because he's only nine. She doesn't want to expose him to these atrocities. But he insisted, and because she didn't tell him, because he was frightened and threatened, he pushed more and more mm. until Bella, the, the owner of the grocery store, couldn't take it anymore, and she took a puff on her cigarette and she gave a krechts, which is a, a Jewish sigh, a very special krechts. <laughs> and and uh, she says that the Nazi beast can come out of any creature if it just gets the right food and nourishment. So she says it ironically, but he's nine years old and he takes her very seriously. So he starts to collect all kinds of animals, a wounded raven and a small cat and a dog and a frog and a turtle. And he puts them in cages, in boxes of uh, Tnuva. And uh, he raises them under the cellar, in the cellar under the apartment of his parents. And he feeds them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And he feeds them and he challenges them. He just waits to the Nazi beast to come out of one of them. Uh, and uh, no, no one comes out. So he starts to learn more and more about what, the, what did the Nazis do and what does it mean to be a Nazi, what does it mean to be a Jew. Uh, and he notices that uh, his lazy turtle uh, comes to life when he gets a sniff of a cucumber peel, so he understands that he has to tempt and to attract the Nazi beast by giving it uh, its most uh, tempting food, and this is the Jew. So he learns to be a Jew. What does it mean to be a Jew? He's an Israeli boy, very, very Israeli, very militant, uh, but he has to become very, very Jewish in order to attract the animal. Yeah. Mm. He doesn't understand that he's a Jew until he knows no. about the Nazi beast. No, no. I remember myself. I was sure that the whole world is Jewish I, at his age. I had nothing to disprove it, so I, I believed it. Yeah. But in the second part of this book, uh, that has four parts, 
Uh, it's called Bruno, and it's yeah. about uh, the Czech uh, Bruno Schulz, who was a writer and a Polish. He was Polish. Yeah. Yes, do, yes. It then was, Poland, was, and yeah. now Ukraine, I think. Ukraine, yeah, yeah. Drobich, mm -hmm. yeah. And and uh, I think uh, that Bruno Schulz who has been uh, edited twice since we newly a new edition of his two books so um, he talked about childhood as and and he was a drawer a, an artist and a writer and childhood to him was the age of genius yeah and as long as you're a child you can do anything you can create anything you're a genius and Momik is a bit of, of a Bruno Schulz figure in his fantasies, isn't he? Uh, yes. Uh, oh, where, where to start? Uh, years ago, many years ago, I published my first novel, uh, The Smile of the Lamb, Lamb uh, in Hebrew, in Israel. And Israel is a very straightforward country and everyone will come and tell me by whom I was inspired, from whom I stole. Mm -hmm. and, and one day the telephone rang and a, a man called me and he said, of course you are highly uh, influenced by Bruno Schulz. I, I didn't know Bruno Schulz until then, but it sounded like a compliment, so I admitted immediately. <laughs> uh, and at that evening, uh, I, I was at the house of friends and I told this anecdote and they gave me the, the book of uh, Bruno Schulz. And I started to read it and I was taken so much by it, I was unable to stop and I, I swallowed it. He, Bruno Schulz is really a genius. I mean, if what comes out of this evening that tomorrow morning you will go and buy the book of Bruno Schulz, I did my job. <laughs> uh, Every paragraph that he writes explodes with mm -hmm. dreams and nightmares and colors and options. And, uh, and quite ordinary people become magic. Everything is magic there. Yeah, he, he, he reinvents reality and he, re he intensifies reality. Uh, and I read the whole book and then I came to the epilogue and there I read about what happened to Bruno Schulz when the Nazis invaded Drohobich, his town and one Nazi officer made him like the uh, slave of, of him uh, and this Nazi officer had another Nazi officer as a, an, an opponent, an enemy and the opponent met Bruno Schulz on the corners of the street Chatsky and Mitskiewicz in Drobich. He pulled his gun and he shot him dead. Then he came to the employer of Bruno Schulz and I told him, I killed your Jew. Very well, said the employer, now I'll kill your Jew. Now, I read this small anecdote and I just didn't want to live anymore. I, I, frankly, I felt I don't want to, to belong to this uh, species of humans. I don't want to to live in a world that allows such monstrous expressions like I kill your Jew, now I'll kill your Jew, as if people are replaceable. Uh, and then I, I went out of my home, we lived then in, uh, near the south of Jerusalem in Talpiot, and I went to Kibbutz Ramat Rachel, and uh, there was a piece of earth there that nobody approached, so I walked for some hours like in a fog, like in a mental fog. And I, I came home and I told Michal, my wife, I said, I want to write a book that will revenge the death of Bruno Schulz and the way it was described. I want to write a book that would uh, shiver on the shelf, mm -hmm. I said, I remember. Mm -hmm. That will have such vitality that would resemble one millionth of the vitality of Bruno Schulz. And that was the beginning of, uh, of the writing of uh, See and the Love. Uh, and in my book, uh, Bruno Schulz, uh, turns to be a salmon fish uh, and he joins the school of salmon and he swims with them because you see the salmon life is like a, 
like an allegory dressed up in flesh. And it's a very Jewish story because the Salmons are always going back to the place where they originated as, as a group. And, uh, well, I'll not tell the whole story, but... Uh, <laughs> but there's one thing you have Bruno Schulz say, as he's already a Salmon, I think. He sees uh, a painting by Munk, yeah. The Scream. The Scream. And he says that it must have been a mistake because you cannot reach that kind of truth unless it's by a mistake or by serendipity. Randomness again. Randomness, serendipity. Yeah, he says that there is a rope around the picture of uh, the scream in the exhibition. And he said, as if uh, it's to protect the picture, but actually you have to protect the spectator from this scream. Uh, mm -hmm. scream. Mm -hmm. So, it's, um, because I've always thought that that picture by Munch mm. is not so, uh, is quite similar to the drawings that Bruno Schulz himself made. I think he was influenced by him as, as, a, as a painter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he must have been. Yeah. You were talking before about um, fate and uh, uh, creating a fate for, your, uh, for the uh, protagonists or for, for the people yeah. in the novels. But in this, the, your latest novel, uh, is, is it the first time that you have sort of transformed a true story, somebody else's story into a novel? Uh, yes. Uh, again, the phone rang. My phone is very busy, as you see. First the guy of Bruno Schulz, and then some 30 years later, <laughs> Eva Panic Nahir. And uh, she, she had a very special intonation, you know, she said, David, you know, like the voice of David Ben-Gurion, our legendary mythological prime minister. And I said, yes, immediately I felt guilty of something. And, and I said, yes. And she, she had, she wanted to make a remark about something I wrote about the settlers the other day. She felt I was too soft on them. I thought I was too harsh on them. And, and then we started to talk and I was taken by her special accent. She had a mixture of Serbo-Croatian, Hungarian, and Hebrew. And uh, I asked her, where does she come from? And she said, I come from the city of Chakovets in Croatia. And uh, I started to investigate her about her life, about her past. And she had a wonderful extreme story and very unique. She was a unique human being. I mean, every one of us is unique. She was unique in a uniquer way. <laughs> and, and she... Uh, <laughs> she started to tell me her story and then when she got to a very tenseful moment in the story she stopped and she said well I don't want to bother you with my boring story maybe I'll call you sometime in the future if it's okay with you and I said yes of course it's okay with me and two days later future came and she called <laughs> and she uh, she continued her story and again at a certain point the most, most pivotal point in the story, she stopped. But then I already recognized the, the Sheikh Rezad method that she used. And she understood that I'm, you know, a writer is someone that is moonwalking behind a, a butterfly when he hears a, a good story. It's irresistible. Uh, and then our friendship started and it lasted 20 years until she died, that died at the age of uh, 97. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it, from the very beginning she asked if I'm going to write her story and I said uh, I think I will write your story I can never promise because I, I can never know if I'm going to write a story or not until it becomes inevitable and I don't know if your story will become inevitable for me I told her very frankly and there were other stories that I wanted to write, uh, Falling Out of Time and To the End of the Land and The Horse mm. Walks into a Bar. And suddenly her story became inevitable. I don't know why, but I just wanted to write it from all the other stories I wanted to write that. And uh, I told her one thing you have to know in advance. I warn you from myself, I'm not a documentarist. I mean, I wrote documentary 
uh, books, but for, for your story, I'm not going to be a documentarist. I'm not going to write you one-to-one. -one. I will invent you also and imagine you and fantasize you. And you have, if you want me to write, you have to accept it. And immediately she said, yes, of course. Mm. And, uh, and so it started, and I wrote her and rewrote her story for many, many years and many, many times. And each time she told her story, I pressured her regarding this, day, this detail or the other detail. And uh, slowly, slowly, the story became alive to me. And her imaginary character, who stood in life next to her real character, became more and more vivid and tangible. Uh, and it's not always easy to write about real human beings, and especially yeah. human beings that you like, because sometimes you have to be tough with your characters, you have to be cruel with them, you have to, to betray them in life because you are very nice and kind to them, and, and yet you are writing horrible things. And, a writer by nature is a betrayal, betraying character because he, he's always a little outside of the scene. He's part of the scene and yet he's outside of the scene and he sees it from his or her point of view. He uh, has a cold eye. What? Uh, uh, part of, of the writer's eye is very cold. Yes, mm. exactly. Mm. Mm. But, but I think... Uh, uh, reading the novel, she is, of course, uh, a wonderful person as a as a creation. You immediately like her, but she ha she has made a terrible choice in her life. Yeah. And and uh, whereas the daughter Nina, she is um, she's a truly unhappy person. Yeah, you can. Yeah, the, that's a way to describe her. By the way, not the real uh, daughter of uh, no. Eva Panich Nahir, whom I met, and she is very cheerful and creative person, very observant, not uh, naive. But uh, the amazing thing is how she managed to overcome the, the trauma of her life and become a, a loving person and a productive person and creative person, as I said. And what is more amazing is that after the trauma that both women were partners of the, the, the mother and the daughter, Eva Panich Nahir and her daughter Tiana, they remained very close and very loving to each other. And, and this is something they, they taught me, you know, that you can coexist with the trauma. Mm -hmm. you, you cannot forget it because so much of your personality is built around it. But you can find ways to be in the trauma without uh, becoming vengeful or hateful. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not an easy, not taken for mm -hmm. granted uh, development. But they, they had it, Tiana and Eva, they had it and they, they taught me. I mean, this is the thing I, I take from this book. Uh, but the whole the whole um, conflict and uh, and their lives is like in a ancient Greek uh, tragedy. It's uh, uh, in that way the situation, the war, and when when uh, sort of the wheels of history t turn around, and then you you were persecuted during the war for being a Jew, and then you're persecuted by Tito. Yeah. And and um, this is really a situation where people. You don't even have to invade a f invent a fate for them. They have a fate. They have a fate, yeah. Uh, but inside this fate, you, cre you can create an inner fate and you mm. can create those uh, randomalities that you mentioned in, in the beginning. I, I, I just want to go back to the question of writing about real people. Years ago, I wrote a book called The Book of Intimate Grammar. Mm -hmm. And the Book of Intimate Grammar is a story about uh, a boy, he's 12, and he, he, he doesn't mature physically. And this changes all his world view, and he, he's like, he feels like a spy in the land of, of other people, his friends. Uh, and he looks for ways to, to 
win over the gland that prevents him from growing up and he understands that it should be done uh, through the language he speaks. The language will dictate the, the, the knowledge or the perception. And he creates for himself a, a little hospital under, under his heart, a little hospital to purify words that he took from the outside, from the, the, the publicity, from the roads, from the, the, the language of the children his age, from the class, from the language of his parents. And he purifies them in a very complicated process. And the family he grew up in uh, resembled, in a way, my, uh, my own family. Uh, and for the three years that I was writing it, I felt terrible because I spent a lot of time with my parents and I love them and I appreciate mm. them. And at the same time, I was writing about a family that resembled this family, a very symbiotic, intrusive mm. Jewish family. And I, I, I felt awful, I must say. And then, before the book was published, I brought it, I brought a printout of it to my parents and I let them read it. I thought it's only fair that they will read it before other people would. And uh, my father read it and said, well, it's a very nice book, uh, David, but do you really think that someone out of our, our family will be able to understand it? <laughs> And, and I thought, well, what a wonderful, sweet thing to yeah. say, you know. And actually, this is what are my wishes from my stories, that, I mean, that people will read them uh, in many places, and whenever there is a new, uh, new uh, language, I come and I tell him, you see, Abba, they have understood. In, in, in Chinese or Japanese or Arabic, they understood. Uh, and I, th that's what I wish, that it will be translated to many languages and that my father will continue to ask, he's 94, will continue to ask, do you think that someone of our family will be able to understand it? Because it indicates he felt something very intimate and yeah. very, very personal. Mm. And he was not offended at all, on the contrary. I mm. think he, show, he, he saw things that until then he didn't want to see, didn't dare to see. Mm. And, and uh, yeah. Well, he was a good reader. He was a very, he is still a very good reader. Uh, yeah. he, is, he still is. Yeah. Um, there is a, in, a horse gets into a bar. I don't know, perhaps some of you haven't read it, but it's, it's a stand-up comedian who has a story to tell. And he calls his, a friend he had when he was a child, who he hasn't met in, in 40 years or so, who is a judge, and asks him to come to really listen to him and watch him and then afterwards tell him what he saw. And this is, yeah. again, storytelling and, and how you see uh, what, how, what, uh, that the story can really make you see reality, life uh, differently. But there's, a, there's an intruder or a witness that the judge needs. And this is a woman who really recognizes the stand-up comedian as he was. She says, you were such a nice boy, she you, says You were, him. you were. You were yes. such a nice boy. And then the judge says to himself, because he's the narrator, that he has to look at her to be able to judge. He sees her reactions yeah. to be able to judge the stand-up comedian. Yeah, because she's so pure. Yeah. She is, uh, I don't know the politically correct word for it, but mentally challenged. Yeah. She's 50 years old and she remembers Dovale, the stand-up comedian from the, the street, the neighborhood they grew up together. And he was kind to her. Uh, and he's not a kind person anymore. No. Life made him bitter and vengeful and even violent. And she, she heard somewhere that he has this performance and she comes to see him. And she is shocked by his vulgarity and rudeness and violence. And she cannot take it anymore. And she shouts and, and she tells him that they were neighbors, but he fails to recognize her. And then she said these words, but you were a good boy. Avalaita Yeletov. And these four simple primal words 
break him suddenly. Mm. You know, as if you, you want to break a rock and you have to find the exact point where to, to put the dagger. And suddenly he's in another place. Suddenly these words uh, opened him and changed him. And uh, he was faced with his real self that he has abandoned. And he maybe understood that he lived irrelevant life and he lived in parallel to his real character, to his real identity even. Yeah. Mm. Th this is, a f a f I, I don't remember having read any figure like his in any of your books before. So, uh, I hope so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you imagine that you will see the same character again and again? It's like a nightmare. Yeah, yeah th this is other kind of literature where you see the same characters all the yeah. time. What I meant was, of course, that he is such a bitter, bitter person, and uh, but he also has uh, a past that make, has made him bitter. So, do you want me to? Yeah, to do what? To tell the past? No, no. No, perhaps we shouldn't spoil that because yeah, it's yeah. it's really important. But but I, I, the whole constellation with the woman, the judge, and Dovere uh, is so special because you have this you you like three parts, don't you? Triangles. Yeah. Yeah, the, in, in one of my books, I wrote that this is probably the most stable structure, the triangle. Uh, yes, because I, I, I thought of it that suddenly uh, the judge and Pitts, Pitts is this little woman, she, she's, all, she's uh, almost uh, a midget. Off, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, each one of them gives him something different. Yeah. Uh, the judge gives him something and Pitts gives him something else and suddenly he stands between his parents. He has a mother and a father. They're, they're absolutely not motherly or fatherly, but he, he needs it. It's like the, the, the last moments in the life of Samson uh, Shimshon from the Bible where he's suddenly he's, he's being uh, led to the pillars, the two pillars on which the whole home is uh, resting, is, is built. And he holds these two pillars and for a second, before he collapses them and kills all the Philistines and himself, for a second he stands between his two parents who never understood him and suspected him all the time and were unable to read his codes and even saw him as, as a dangerous person and almost as an enemy. And suddenly he was able to hug those pillars and to make them fall mm. on himself and on, on all the rest. So. That was my feeling when I wrote uh, both of them. The day that s suddenly something in him recognizes something that maybe with open eyes, with sobriety, would be unable to recognize. And the, the, something that only physicality can reveal to us. Like walking. Like walking, like uh, making love, mm. uh, like getting. Used, used to the fact that we have a body and we have no. to adjust to it and to respond to the capriciousness of our body. Uh, w whenever I start writing, I start from the body always. Mm -hmm. I cannot write a character unless I understand her physically. Uh, and I, I, I can feel it has to be totally tangible. Mm. Uh, and only then I'm able to start to talk about, you know, uh, the ideas that she has, the worldview, all, all these sometimes abstract thoughts, philosophical thoughts. But the basis, the thing that connects me is, is, is the body. Yeah. So, so uh, to the end of the land where Ora and uh, Ilan, they, or is it Avram? I mix them all the time. Ilan is the husband, ah, Avram, Avram is... is Ora and Avram, they yeah. are walking in Upper Galilee, I think. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's a huge book, and I, I still remember that walk as if I was walking with them, you know, as a third person <laughs> again. <laughs> <laughs> you will be the fourth person, by the way. 
<laughs> I mean, there is a queue. I mean, yeah. don't. don't. <laughs> Yeah. And also fallen out of time, uh, yeah. the people who sort of meet and walk together to, to sharing sorrow is something that is really important in your books, I think. The importance of, of sharing sorrow to yeah. be able to not necessarily let it go away, but to feel it. Yeah, not to escape it, not to avoid a you know we we lost my family and I we mm. lost our son Uri 15 years ago in the war between Israel and the Hezbollah mm. in Lebanon and I wrote this book because a falling out of time because I I I needed I needed to find my way to uh, to understand what happened but more to and to understand is is not the exact word to be in what uh, has happened to me to my family uh, and I read books about such loss, and some of them were very good books, mm. but they did not say, they did not tell me what I felt that w- and what I did not have words to. And uh, I remember I felt that grief is like to be sent to to an island, mm. isolated, totally isolated island. And I felt if I was unfortunate to to experience what I had experienced, I will, if I was thrown into this island of isolation, at least I will map it with my own words. At least I will mm. write what I feel when I am there. Uh, and, uh, well, it, it didn't come easily. And at first I felt horrible that I even dared to put in words, in small words, uh, such a catastrophe, such magnitude of, of pain and of grief and of loss. And on the other hand, I felt I cannot continue my life until I write it, until mm. I understand, until I bring myself there and find a way to call by the name, by my private and intimate names, uh, to give it a name. Mm. After all, I think now, this is what we do when we write books. We give it private names. Mm. We take a situation, and most situations were dealt with already in, in the history of mankind. And what we do is to to give it n- new and intimate words. Uh, hopefully there will be this raz that I spoke about in the beginning, this deeper than thing than than secret uh, thing, uh, and I I wrote it in a form of uh, poetry. Mm. I'm not a poet, but somehow I was unable to write it as simple prose, as if the the rules of grammar should be different uh, or syntax should be different, because what happened is contradictory to the right order of things that. Uh, children outlive their parents, mm. not as, as it was for us. Uh, and uh, Michal, my wife, said that maybe I'm writing poetry because the poetry, because poetry is the closest to silence. Yes. And, and that, that, that is very right, I think. Uh, and I also learned... Poetry is also out of time. Out of time, yes. yes. Yeah, you're right. Where is... Stories are in time. Yeah. In a way. Yeah, yes. Mm. Good definition. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, You're welcome. <laughs> I, you know, I'm, I'm not a believer. I, I, I'm an out and out secularist. And I don't believe in afterlife, mm. which I know religious people can find solace in. I cannot, but I I found out that there is a place where I can feel simultaneously the the plenty and the wealth of being, uh, of vitality, of creativity, and at the same time the the horrible nothingness and darkness and abyssness of, of death. And this place where we simultaneously can feel both of them is art. 
is storytelling or mm. writing poetry or making music or all kinds of art are are the, the place where we are able to experience both contradictory qualities of to be and not to be at mm. the same time mm. and I think that the books that were the most meaningful and relevant and raful for me were those who were telling this story from this place mm. Mm. yeah Now I had the idea that we should talk a lot about politics and oh, come Israel. Come on, why to ruin such a good evening? <laughs> exactly, what I was going to say. Because I feel, after this, how could we? But still, there will be another time for that. Okay. So, I think we should say thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.